I really need to use this mic? Or no. Would you prefer? Or, or yes. Yeah. 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 Prefer is going to be the way. You just you can just stand in front of it. Oh. <laughs> Terrible. <clears throat> and don't touch. <laughs> I, I won't touch. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, when Chris said, uh, should we do the wine drawing before or after, I was deeply conflicted because <laughs> if I'm pulling it, then it means some people are going to like me a lot, <laughs> but a lot more people aren't going to like me at all. Still love you. That's right. Um, so I thought what I would do today is um, talk a little bit about how our culture is changing and how I think that... Uh, orchestras need to do some things an awful lot better, or if not better, a lot different from, um, from what we've already done. So um, I want to start by uh, just giving you a little bit of sort of sense of, of some things that have changed, the way that the audience's um, expectations are changing. And then um, I've got five sort of strategies that I think might be um, interesting to try. Uh, around uh, interacting with these audiences in, in a little bit different way. Um, first, though, um, uh, how many of you were in Atlanta? Okay, and how many actually saw my talk in Atlanta? Oh, okay, well, not too many. <laughs> this is a little bit different. Um, sort of same title. Um, we know that, uh, that the culture is changing in some pretty dramatic ways, and we've been in a, a bubble in the last 50 years of, of, of a kind of mass culture. Um, but so what we, what we then have is um, uh, it becomes more difficult to get somebody's attention. Uh, and you end up with this kind of supermarket of, of products here, wherein um, if you're trying to make something and it happens to be on a lower shelf somewhere, uh, the, the ability of the consumer to actually even find it, is, um, it becomes more and more difficult. In other words, it's very different to get somebody's attention. And what we're starting to call this is, is the attention economy. In other words, the, the um, challenge in today's uh, over-informationalized, over-culturized uh, society is that just getting somebody's attention for what it is that you're doing is a bigger and bigger problem. So the trick here is to try and change that into, if, if, if it's just a, a question of getting, um, uh, uh, getting somebody's attention at the point that they're willing to have um, uh, an interaction with you, uh, it's a very difficult thing. And so what we want to do is we want to change from the attention economy uh, in which you're just making a, a choice out of a thousand different things that you might not know a lot into, uh, into something that we call the intention economy, where you create relationships with people uh, so that uh, when it comes time for them to make a decision, they've already got that relationship with you and they're willing to uh, deepen that relationship in some time. Now, this is nothing really new. This is, you know, this is a basic salesmanship one-on-one. Um, but the thing about the internet age is that technology makes it an awful lot easier to be able to uh, get directly to people and have them uh, receive your message and be able to act on it. Uh, the problem is, of course, is that everybody understands this at this point. And so uh, what that ends up happening is, is that uh, the information uh, byways become even more clogged um, with more information, right? And so you're just upping the ante of uh, the information age, the attention age. So um, traditionally what we've done when we've talked about um, trying to find out a little bit more about who our potential audience is, is we go to measure them, right? Uh, and the way that we measure traditionally is we segment and we, we do it in a demographic way. So we want to know your ethnicity, we want to know your age, we want to know your geography, we want to know all these kinds of things about that. And based on that, we're going to make a set of guesses about what it is that might motivate you to have a relationship with us. The problem is, of course, is that these are just guesses. Uh, we don't really know very specifically about how you're going to act within your particular market segment. So we need a different way. And what's happening on the internet now is that we're, we're not charting so much by your demographic information, 
but we're, tra we're charting you by uh, what your behavior is. We don't really so much care about whether you're a 17-year-old girl and you happen to live in Yellow County. We care about what it is that, that, that you, how it is that you behave. And the reason uh, for that is that we can make not guesses about how it is that you're going to behave, but we can actually specifically track how it is that you're going to behave based on your past behavior. So instead of looking at demographic research um, uh, to, to make those guesses, we've now, they've now settled on this kind of idea of, of six kind of basic behaviors uh, that people exhibit online. Um, and um, this, is, this, is, this is proving to be a very powerful way of, of starting relationships with people. So in the top section here, uh, the, the number one category is creators people who are um, publishing web pages, they write blogs, they upload videos, uh, they're, they're making things, and they're putting them online so that others can see them. Second category is critics, people who are going and taking a look at all of that stuff, and they're gathering it up in some way uh, to make assessments about it. They want to point their friends to, it's kind of what I am, is, is, a, is a person who points people to other information. Then we have collectors, people who are just going out, getting the stuff and bringing it in for their own use. Joiners, uh, those people who find their community online. They're not going out so much for information sake, they're going out because that's where they get their community, people who share their interests. Then we have spectators, people who are, uh, the, 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 the un-PC way of referring to them is, um, is lurkers. <laughs> um, and a great deal of us are lurkers. Um, you see something interesting, you go, wow, that's really interesting, and then you move on. You don't really have an interaction with the, with the information. And finally, we have inactives. Inactives doesn't mean that you don't use online. It means that you're not interacting online. You're just there. You're getting email. You're, you're doing it. But you're not really having um, a relationship with, uh, with people. Uh, now, you'll see that, that across this chart, uh, it's by age segment. So the, the, the nearest one to me is young teens, and it goes all the way up to seniors. And you'll see that in the center part here uh, is the, the joiner section and the uh, collector spectators. That's, that's where the younger people are starting to, uh, to, to use the internet. It's not an information source. It's a, a place for them to have community. Um, by the way, I, I started with uh, started this, and I forgot to say something important at the beginning, which is um, you'll see on a lot of these slides in the upper right-hand corner my phone number. Um, that is to my cell phone, which is right here. Uh, and if you have a question while we're going along here uh, and want to ask that question, just text to that number, and I will get it and I will answer your question. Wow. If it's an interesting question, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, I'll really seriously answer, answer your question. This kind of measurement of audience radically changes the way in which you can predict behavior. And companies like Google are all about data. The, the, the data revolution and the ability to be able to collect data on people about their behavior and then to act on it in some important way is completely revolutionizing the way people do business. And we're only at the sort of 2% into this at this point. Over the next five years, you're going to see a huge revolution in this as mobile data tracks where you are, what you're doing, who you're talking to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is data that, in one sense, can be very scary because people are tracking what you do. But in another sense, can be a very powerful thing, a powerful tool for uh, building communities around you. Uh, somebody's asking, will your presentation be available online afterwards? Um, I want to download these charts. Yes, I'll put them up on uh, SlideShare, and I'll uh, give Chris the link, and, and you can come and see them there. So if you think that the world is actually <laughs> looks like this, it doesn't. It actually looks more like this. <laughs> the first is the demographic measurement. This is behavior measurement. Now, this chart, actually, I got from a blog back in 2007. And you'll see here uh, MySpace. MySpace here. Look at how small Facebook is. 
Very different. Every night this map changes. Yeah. It's a behavior map. Okay? Now, if, if this is happening every night, you have to have a way of being able to keep up with it. Okay, everybody talks about that viral uh, thing that happens, viral marketing, right? Um, this chart is the best way I know to kind of explain the viral phenomenon. Uh, this person is, this is LinkedIn. How many are, are members on LinkedIn? Yeah, quite a few, okay. So this chart is, is LinkedIn, and this person has 334 friends, which is actually quite a lot of friends. And let's say uh, I uh, create a message that is so compelling that every one of my 334 friends feels compelled to send it on to their friends, to all of their friends. That means from one click, one message that I send, one click, it's going out now to 84,000 people because it's going out to all of their friends. Okay, and so let's say that it's the absolutely cutest cat video ever. <laughs> <laughs> and that compels all of those 84,000 people to send it to all their friends. Within two clicks, you've reached three and a half million people. Now, there is, believe me, there's no message out there that's going to compel everybody to send it to every one of their friends. But you can see how rapidly this goes just from within two clicks. So if you can get even half of those people to, to act on some message that you have, uh, it sure makes that seasoned brochure that you spent a lot of money on and you, you, you sent out by hand uh, seem kind of, kind of uh, tame by comparison. But let's not get too excited about that, because when you take a look at some of these social networks, like this is for Twitter, let's imagine that this is 100 people, 100 average users on Twitter, right? Okay, so 20 of them are dead accounts. That means 20 people are not using it anymore. 50 are what we call lazy. They only tweet like once every week or so. You know, they don't, they don't do it very often. Um, and um, et cetera, et cetera. It's f the, the ones you want to get to are the five loudmouths, right? Um, five loudmouths are out there. They've got lots of followers, and they will retweet anything that you do, right? Um, only five, by the way, five of all of these people have more than 100 followers on Twitter. So you can see that it's not so much about accumulating numbers of followers <coughs> on social networks. Um, it's about what you can motivate those followers to be able to do. Right? It's not just about, oh, I have 10,000 followers. It's, it's having relationships with those people, which gets them to do something for you. Um, and here's why. You know, when, when you look at, at um, ads uh, online, uh, one of the reasons that uh, ads online are not terribly effective, even though we can track uh, the audience for them in a better way, uh, is that the click-through rate is phenomenally low. It's only 0.10%. That means for every 1,000 people who see a banner ad online, only one person is motivated to do it. And in fact, the advertising inventory has gotten so big now that, this is Times Square, that there's such a plethora of an overwhelming uh, sea of ad messages out there that it's, it's really, really difficult for you to fight through the clutter and be able to see. Um, uh, and there's another problem as well. And one of the problems is that um, with all of this choice, choice is supposed to be a better thing, right? Is, uh, we all want the choice to do things. Um, but the problem is, is that there's something that, that Barry Schwartz, uh, who this is, is a, a, who's a sociologist, um, and has done some studies on, on how people make choices, is there's something that he calls the tyranny cho of choice, or the paradox of choice. Um, and um, uh, what that is, is that when you're confronted with massive amounts of choice, uh, it becomes more and more difficult for you to sort through it.